Mike Gabriel tonight. Um, maybe a lot of you, like Ron, has seen him around. He spent last year going through the county, inventorying structures. At that time, he was one of six counties in the state that had not been inventoried. Right now, this year, he's working over in LaGrange. He was born in Ann Arbor and grew up there. And then he uh, went on to school and he got his degree in classical musician, which he plays, still plays for the Fort Wayne Symphony. I do. And he also was interested in history. So he got a second degree in history. And he used to volunteer for Arch. Now he's an employee. He's the historic preservation specialist. I am. So, uh, so, and he's very involved and he's very knowledgeable. And I would like to see every picture he took. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> his program tonight is sitting at the lake cottage style. Thank you, Peggy. Thanks. Well, before I start, I would like to thank Peg for having the diligence and the patience to track me down and, and cajole me and say, if my first date wouldn't work, maybe my second date would work. And eventually, we got a date that worked. I think it was five dates, Peg holding her hands. Um, one of the things about historic preservation, and Peg's about as perfect of an example as you could have possibly imagine, is it takes perseverance. And so thank you, Peg. Um, the other people I'd like to thank are Ron and Lita Sullins, who, um, again, are some of the organizing forces um, in the Fremont area, area for historic preservation. Um, I'm talking today about um, cottage style. Um, and I think if we hit the lights in the front section, that might work a little bit better. Is that better? Yeah. OK. Um, again, I'm Michael Galbraith. I work for Arch in Fort Wayne. Um, Arch is a historic preservation not-for-profit. Um, that means that we advocate um, for historic preservation. We help people um, learn things about historic preservation. Um, we try to work with historic preservation in Allen County and throughout Northeast Indiana. Um, again, Arch. One of the things I'd like to do is acknowledge a couple of people who helped fund the survey. Um, the Indiana Sites and Structures Survey um, is a program that was started in about the 1960s, the late 1960s. Um, 1966 saw the passage of a, of a historic law um, whereby the federal government is mandated to take into account what effect their actions have on historic structures. So part of Indiana's responsibility as a state is if the federal government has to take into account what effect their actions have, Indiana has to tell them, these are our historic structures. Um, Peg said earlier that Steuben County is one of six counties as of, of last year that had not been surveyed. Um, I think we're down to two. Um, LaGrange is one of them, and we're covering that. I'm covering that this year. And I think at that point, they start to go back to some of the surveys that were done um, in the late 60s, which, as you can imagine, are woefully out of date. Um, the first people I'd like to acknowledge are the Steuben County Community Foundation. They provided the match um, of funding, the local match, that allowed us to do this. Um, another group that I'd like to acknowledge is Arch United. Um, Arch is a funded member of Arch United, and Arch United serves, I think it's an 11 county um, region of Northeast Indiana. And the third people I'd like to acknowledge um, is the Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology. It's inside the division. Um, Department of Natural Resources of Indiana. Um, they are the ones who administer the survey program. Um, why Northern Indiana? Um, Northern Indiana, and especially Steuben County, has probably the greatest collection of cottages in the state of Indiana. Um, we look at the lakes in Indiana, and when we were doing the survey, we kept telling the folks in, Indiana in Indianapolis, you, you just don't understand. Um, even though the population of Steuben County is the same or far less than places like DeKalb or Allen County or um, probably the same population as LaGrange County, you're going to have so many more structures than you can possibly imagine because of all the lakes. And they said, no, there's no way. Um, we, we're going to say you're going to get 1,100 structures. Um, we ended up with over 1,600 structures just because, as you all know, when you come to the lake, um, the structures aren't set back, you know, a quarter of a mile from each other. They're, they're 50 feet or less. Um, so Northern Indiana, and they came for the lakes. Um, and this is a good a picture um, from the, from, of Clear Lake um, of why they came. 
They came in about starting in the 1870s, and they came because it was beautiful. Um, they came for recreation. They came to fish. They came to have vacations. They came with their families. Again, they came to fish. They came to, to, to recreate. This is a picture at Penn Park in, in Hamilton Lake. Again, the other reason they came, it's beautiful. It always has been beautiful. It remains beautiful. It still will be beautiful. Um, one reason they didn't come was because of the charming um, accessible road network. Um, Indiana in the 1870s um, was, was, was a mess. We didn't have great roads. We didn't have a lot of paved roads. Um, and as you can see from this really kind of humorous postcard, um, travel on a road wasn't easy. So how did they come? They came by train. Um, they came on trains from cities like Fort Wayne and Toledo, Ann Arbor, Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, all through the Midwest. Um, and they would come and the, because trains were easier. They were faster. They were cheaper. They were cleaner. Um, and they got you there. The one drawback of trains was the limited routing of trains. In 1888, through Steuben County, you can see there's one railroad line. And the railroad line that you can see is the Jackson, um, uh, the Fort Wayne, Jackson, and Saginaw Railroad. And through Steuben County, it stopped at, what, four places. It stopped at Pleasant Lake, it stopped at Angola, it stopped at Fremont, and it stopped at Ray. Those four stops dictated, to some extent, which of the early lakes prospered. Um, because it was easier to get, for instance, from the, from the Ray stop to Clear Lake, Clear Lake was one of the lakes that developed early. Um, in addition, Clear Lake is one of those lakes that has um, an extremely deep lake, so it's cleaner than, than a lot of lakes. In the 1870s, this is what the Fort Wayne and Jackson Fort Wayne, Jackson, and Saginaw train look like. Ten years later, you could see the beginning of a second line through the county that went off the, the, the lower uh, tier of uh, townships um, cr crossing over. And what this did was allow the development um, of Hamilton Lake um, in, as another primary destination. Um, about ten years later, there was a third line that went through the county um, that went from Angola through Orland and then to LaGrange. This is the famous Arnica Salve line um, run by a name, man named Buckland. Um, it was a very short-lived line, but that allowed the development of Lake Gage. Again, why northern Indiana? Um, one of the things that we take for granted um, living the way that we do now is the use of air conditioning. Um, in the 1870s, um, summers in Indiana, as they always are, are hot. Um, people came to the lakes because it was a chance for them to cool off. Um, temperatures off of the lake sometimes are as much as five degrees cooler than the rest of, of, the, of Indiana. And in addition, you, you, not only is the temperature actually cooler, you get nice cool breezes. And if that doesn't fail, just jump in the darn lake. Um, so air conditioning wasn't invented until 1902. Um, it wasn't first used in, in big buildings until the 1920s. So the first time that they used them in major theaters and major um, uh, things like department stores, all of that sort of stuff, wasn't until the 20s. It wasn't until the 30s that was the first residential use, and wasn't until the late 50s that, that finally air conditioning became into widespread residential use. So that's kind of a chronology that affects the lake cabin and why people lived at the lakes. Um, when I started this, I, I started surveying Steuben County, and the first thing I came to was, was um, Clear Lake. So I, I'm, I'm looking at all these houses, and they don't fit into any of my definitions that I've been given by the, the <laughs> Department of Natural Resources, the Indiana Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology, because what they're saying is Queen Anne Cottage. Um, and that's something that is very much apparent on the streets of Angola, and is very much apparent on the streets of Fremont. Um, they say this is an Italianate. Okay, that's great. Um, but that's not what I'm seeing on the lakes. So I started talking to them, and I started thinking about it. What's a cottage? 
I mean, we, we all know what a cottage is. And, 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 you know, there's a real famous quote that, you know, I can't, I can't define it, but, but I know it when I see it. Um, the, the, the cottage is the same thing. It's, it's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. So I started to try to define it. Um, I, I, the first thing I said was it was built pre-air conditioning. So I started to put in um, before 1955 when widespread um, air conditioning came into use in building construction. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the cottage was something that was built with a three-month habitation window. It was designed to be something in the summer. Um, it wasn't designed to be a full year-round place. Um, something else that, that the cottages seemed to have were an extensive use of porches. The, the, those cottages were built with a sleeping porch sometimes. They were built with a front porch and a rear porch and a side porch and a second floor porch and all sorts of porches because, again, it was built pre-air conditioning and it was hot. So the best thing to do was to get outside where it was a little bit cooler. Um, another thing that I talked about with cottages was the strong relationship to outdoor recreation. So mostly in Sioux Bend County, I'm looking at cottages that were built on the lakes. Um, as I'm starting to get into LaGrange a little bit, I'm looking at cottages and they're built a little bit more along the river because the, the Pigeon River in LaGrange County is a little bit more of a recreation resource than, than any of the rivers in Steuben County. Um, they don't have quite as many lakes as you do, um, but the river is a little bit more prominent. Um, and the other thing that I looked at um, is something that is, is an architectural term and it's called single pile massing. And it's, that simply means that it's one room deep. And those cottage doors were one room deep because they could open the windows on both sides and the air would come through and would cool it down. So that's what I looked at for defining a cottage. Um, this is about as typical of an early cottage as I could picture. Um, and it identifies those same elements. Um, single pile massing, again, it's one room deep. When you open up the windows on this side of the house and this side of the house, the, the air would go right through. Um, built, again, right next to outdoor recreation, prominent use of porches, um, pre-air conditioning, all of those things I was talking about earlier in what is a cottage. Um, one of the things that the state wanted me to do was differentiate between um, architectural styles and cottage era styles. Um, when you talked about a, a Queen Anne cottage, which is the, the, the typical Victorian gingerbread cottage that we all think about, um, they didn't want me to say this is a Queen Anne cottage. They wanted me to say something because you know, that messes up the, the statistics on, on the percentage of Indiana cottages and Indiana houses that are built in the, in the Queen Anne style. Um, and that's something that, you know, that they, they keep track of. So what we started talking about were four different eras. And the first era that was the resort era. Again, um, the earliest people that came to the lakes came on trains. And most of them didn't come to first, they, for, at first they didn't come to cottages. At first they came to resorts. So I categorized the first set of, of cottages that were built as resort era cottages from 1870 to 1910. The, the first set, um, and I'll break this down a little bit even further, is the Gilded Age. Again, the Gilded Age in American history was one where the, they first had the tycoons, the Carnegies, um, and all of the big, big, big um, tycoons of American history. Um, the um, Platts of Indiana were first developed, uh, Platts around Steuben County were first developed in that age. And this sort of set the pattern for um, how development would happen around the lakes. P entrepreneurs would buy up large sections, farmers would buy up large sections, and they would subdivide them into smaller lots. Um, again, because the most valuable thing on that lot was the lake frontage, the, the way that they divided them really made a lot of economic sense. They would divide them into real long, thin, narrow lots with the smallest possible amount of lake frontage compared to the largest number of lots. Um, and, and you know, as, as somebody that, that watches the economics of historic preservation, that makes a whole lot of sense because you can get more cottages on a smaller number of, uh, a smaller amount of land. Um, <coughs> the Gilded Age is, is, is one of those things as a quote from Mark Twain shows where, where they, this was the sort of Teddy Roosevelt theory of um, recreation, that they were really, really um, about as, um, 
enthusiastic about recreating as you can possibly imagine. They were out to have as much fun as they possibly could in a short amount of time, and gosh darn it, no one was getting in the way of having fun right darn now. Um, so they were extremely vigorous, and it was chiefly men about, I'm going to be, I have a, you know, 12 days of vacation, and I'm going to be fishing for 12 days, I'm going to be golfing for 12 days, I'm going to be hunting for 12 days, and by the way, maybe I'll take a canoe ride too. Um, so they packed it all in. Um, so they were, the Gilded Age was one of those ages where those um, first started. Um, for families as well, Mike, yes? Uh, a lot of people probably don't know that that was the golf course at Clear Lake, and you can't necessarily see the captain's back here. Okay. I, I will identify that. Um, again, Ron has identified that that was the golf course at Casota, um, which was one of the, the bigger resorts here on Clear Lake. Um, this picture um, is from Hamilton Lake. Um, and and it, what I want, want to talk about this was that not only did the men come up here and recreate, the families came up here too. Um, often the families would come up and spend a longer time than the men would. The men would, would be able to work um, in the summers and they would come on the weekends. Um, the families often would come here and spend a lot longer time. They would be here for, for almost three months sometimes. Um, again, what can you I mean, possibly imagine of, of, you know, I'm the father of a seven-year-old and a five-year-old and all summer long I'm thinking, oh my gosh, these guys are going to kill me because they've got so much energy that I'm going to be sunk by two o'clock in the afternoon. So what they did back then and even now, they figured out ways to have those little kids burn off as much energy as they possibly could. So what they did, and this was a picture again from Hamilton Lake, this was a toboggan slide that ran right into the lake. They'd get those kids on the toboggan, then they'd get on the lake, send them up the ladder, send them back out, and then they would do it all over again. Um, so here's that water toboggan. Again, the first set of people came to hotels. Um, Indiana had not really developed the lake cottages as, as much between 1870 um, and 1890. Um, this is again at Clear Lake, this is the Lakeside Hotel. Um, this is from, you can see in that era when the cars are just beginning, um, but horse-drawn carriages are still in, in effect. Um, these happened at all the lakes, not only at Clear Lake. Here's one at uh, Cold Springs at Hamilton Lake. Another, another hotel at Clear Lake. Um, it's, what's interesting is uh, I, I like to study people as well as architecture. So I like to look at this picture because you've got the group, the group of men over here being very serious. They've still got their coats and their ties on. And then you've got what would, would appear to be just the, the wives and kids um, in a long-term uh, you know, friendship and relationship. It, and it's interesting that the groups are, are as separate as they are. Um, eventually, small place, small hotels grew to big hotels. This is another Clear Lake Hotel. This is the Hayes and Hurst, um, which is, again, long gone, um, but a significant um, structure when it was here. Um, hotels not only were a place to sleep, but they were places to eat as well. They were social centers. Um, the, they, the people came here, they lived here, they ate here, they recreated here, they socialized here. Um, there were cooks and there were waiters and there were bands. Um, everything that could happen for these um, upper and upper middle class people happened at these hotels. Um, so you, you've, you've all seen the movies that have happened out of this kind of relationship where uh, Hollywood picked up the idea that, that vacation hotels were this hotbed of romance. Um, you, you've all seen Dirty Dancing and you know, Summer Place and all of these kinds of movies. Um, but some of, the, some of that really was reality. There, there were lots and lots of um, women and children and, and then lots and lots of waiters and busboys and dancers that looked like Patrick Swayze. Um, <laughs> Uh, again, this is another one of, uh, of, of Hayes and Hearst. Um, these hotels kept large amounts of land. They kept large amounts of amenities for those guests. So they would have boats, they would have horses, they would have trails, they would have water follies like that toboggan. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the guests would use them. Eventually, they decided, you know what, at the end of, the th of three months, my bill is kind of huge. So maybe it makes more sense if I start to build my own cottage. So the first co kind of cottages they built, um, I just described as, as vernacular. And vernacular simply means 
what people build in kind of a folk tradition. Um, when, when, when they first started building things, there was knowledge that was handed down from the different cultures. So in the English culture, you know, you, you would learn what that building is that, that you store cows in, what that looks like. Um, and that looks different than the building in the German culture, that same building that you store cows in. Um, so as the barns um, became different, just so the houses became different. So the first vernacular style, um, I talk about as a gable front cottage. Um, these were typically built on piers, um, often because it was three months only, um, and often they, because they were so close to the recreational resources, typically water, that the soils were sandy or marshy. Um, so that they, they wanted to get the building off of the ground, but not only did that allow to not have wood in contact with wet soil, which pr promotes rot, as you're all aware, um, but it also allowed some of the, um, the heat to dissipate because the, the air would get underneath that building. Um, this example is a one-story building. It's got these um, piers that I was talking about. It's got the extensive use of porches. And this one, um, the, the orientation is um, parallel to the lake so that the, f the cottage actually faces the lake, that the, the roof line runs parallel. Um, this one is a one and a half story cottage. Again, I've, sh I've shown you this picture before as a definition of what the cottages look like. Um, one and a half story simply means that there were two stories, although the roof line extended a little bit lower on the side so that those windows are smaller than a typical window would be. So that's a one and a half story house. Um, again, built on piers to promote, you know, the, stay away from the sandy or marshy soil, promote a little bit of uh, hot weather relief. Extensive use of porches here in the front and in the back this time. The orientation, again, is parallel to the, to the lake. Um, gable front is an is a architectural term, and that means that the front, it, which is this gable here, this triangular element, faces the road or the, or the resource. One of the interesting things about um, cottages in Steuben County is defining them as gable front or, or side gable because typically when you look at a house, um, if you, you say gable front, the front of the house faces the road. And here, the front of the house does not face the road. So I, I, I kept having to define that to the guys in Indianapolis. No, that's the rear of the house, even though that, that's what you see when you take a picture from the road. Um, so side gables, again, the gable is away from the lake. Again, on piers, extensive use of porches, side gables. And the side gable means that this is parallel to the lake. These were um, not as popular as the, as the gable fronts just because on a small lake lot, they took up a little bit more room um, and left you more land that was not in use. You ever talk about the pitch of those roofs? Yeah, those roofs are very high. Those 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 those, ro those roofs are very high pitched, and that was a style um, that w in that period that that was something that's a defining characteristic of that style. Um, as you go to, to later cottages, for instance, this one right here in this photo, um, you'll notice that the pitch of that roof is significantly lower, um, and that changed in around the 1910s. Again, here's Clear Lake one more time, um, and it's th this is on the South Shore in about, um, from 1890 to 1910. Um, it shows this early side gable vernacular cottage way down here. You can see this, um, and it's very early. You can see that it's got wood clabbering. Um, it's one, one and a half story with a very, very small upper story. Um, they, again, the early developers would buy the lots and start to subdivide it. You can start to see the development happening here. This is the same, sh same piece of land. Um, the, you can see the, the spaces between the cottages. Um, a bit later, another postcard, it, it starts to fill up a lot. Not only is that early cottage gone, but the space in between that and the other, other cottages has started to fill in. Um, one of the things that's happened at the lakes is that people start to replace these smaller cottages. Um, with bigger cottages. And this is something that's happened for as long as the lakes have been here. Um, and as much as I hate to see 
you know, ver, you know, vintage cottages disappear. It's not something that's surprising, nor is it something that that, that you can do a whole lot about, um, other than than actually owning the cottage yourself. Um, lakes were also something that were they were centers not only for the people that lived at the lakes they were centers for people that that lived in the area they were centers for people that lived in Fremont and Hamilton and Angola um, because again it's summer it's hot it's Indiana um, you've got 10,000 people in an unair conditioned room and it's 95 degrees out um, thank gosh for um, cool breezes off the lake um, so this hall is at um, Circle Park, which is down on Hamilton Lake. Um, and this was one that that's, was three stories tall, had a, had a ballroom on one floor, um, a, a, a roller skating rink on the other. Um, this one, again, still at Hamilton Lake, is a, is a dance hall um, at Cold Springs Resort. They had a, a, a resident band that would stay there all summer long, and they would have dancing five nights a week. Um, other places still in existence um, were places like uh, Bledsoe's Beach on Lake James. Um, here's Cold Springs again. Um, but people would crowd there. They would, they would not only be the vacationers, but there would be the people from the towns as well. Um, this is one that people would, uh, you, you'd see crowds, but this is William Jennings Bryan's here to make a stump speech um, at, at Cold Springs. Um, just like today, you know, the, the politicians, when you, when you brought together the, the movers and shakers of that period, that's, that's who they wanted to talk to because that's who made the, the campaigns run. So William Jenny Bryan talking to the, the vacationers um, at Cold Springs. The next cottage style I'd like to talk about um, happened in another era, in the arts and crafts era. Um, is something that we, it's pretty, pretty identifiable to us. Most of us talk about craftsman style cottages and arts and crafts style furniture. Um, people like uh, Lewis Comfort Tiffany, um, Stickney in, in furniture and green and green um, in terms of architecture um, started to develop cottage style. So, this is a craftsman house, and, and it's, it's, I want to show some of the elements that ended up showing up on craftsman style cottages at the lakes. Um, one of the first things um, are, are ex exposed beam tails. Now you can see that this beam of the roof actually sticks out, um, and that's something that started to be something that when people built their own cottages, it was a stylistic element. You'd also see something called knee braces. These are these triangular elements side of the house. Um, that helped identify it as a craftsman. Again, um, not only were there beam tails, there were rafter tails. The beams went one way and the rafters went the other. And by extending them out so that they were visible, you, they were showing the, 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 almost the kind of the purity of the work that they had done. They were very proud that this, this had been done by their own craft. Um, and one other thing that, that the cottages of the, art, the craftsman style had um, were these support posts. And you'll notice that this, these are um, square, but at the top of the square is a little bit smaller than the bottom of the square. And that's something that's a real typical element of the craftsman style, and that's called battering. Um, those craftsman style cottages also used multi-pane windows. Um, they, that one had, had 10 over 1 and 4 over 1. <laughs> this Craftsman style cottage um, is on Long Lake uh, uh, near, uh, near Pleasant Lake. So again, knee braces, exposed rafter tails. And this is an interesting thing. During the Craftsman era, they used, they used this smaller clabberding. Um, it was real thin. And if you look at some of the Craftsman style houses, um, th that was a real typical stylistic element. Um, one of the things that this still retains is, is its cottage um, elements. Um, it, it's got an extensive use of porches. You can see here that it's been glassed in, um, but, but they would open those windows up. Um, it still retains its single pile massing, um, and it's got a parallel orientation to the lake. During the Roaring Twenties, um, the, the Jazz Age and Prohibition and affluence 
um, led to continuing development on the lakes. Um, the beginning of the automobile age led to um, the opening of more lots and the opening of more lakes. No longer were, was the only way to get to the lakes f was uh, on the railroads. They started to have roads in, in Steuben County. There was a widespread improvement program to make sure that those lakes um, were, were accessible by cars. Um, one of the other things that was interesting in, in, um, in Steuben County, I was working on something about a fish hatchery. Um, and in Steuben County, one of the things they developed was that, that conservation clubs would, would make their own fish hatcheries. And they had this, this kind of very cool scheme um, that, that, that I think is, is, is just really kind of an aside for me here. Um, they would raise the fish, and the state would pay them to raise the fish, and then the state would buy the fish back from them and put them in the lakes and ponds, and then those guys would catch the fish and eat them. <laughs> Um, the next era I kind of want to talk about is the pre-interstate era. One of the things that, again, we forget about, just like air conditioning, is how much our country changed with the introduction of interstates in 1955. Um, interstates have made the railroad extinct. They have made um, travel on, on state and, 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 and highway roads um, much different than it was before. Um, there are lots and lots of small towns in Indiana that were crossroads. Um, that when they got bypassed by the interstate, lost their economic vitality. Um, during this era, I kind of want to talk about two, two eras. The first one is depression and war. Um, for the lakes, this was a gigantic problem. Um, obviously, the upper middle class and upper class um, were in as much trouble as everyone else. Um, and they simply didn't have as much free time and didn't have as much money to spend going to the lakes um, as they had previously. Um, so kind of playtime disappeared for a little bit. Um, one of the things that did happen, especially in, in, in Steuben County, was the introduction of New Deal um, era projects. Um, and this is one from uh, the CCC here in Steuben County. Um, they started to build things at, at uh, lakes and at parks, especially at something like Pokagon Park, um, where they had um, Works Projects Administration, um, Public Works Administration, Civilian Conservation Corps. They had the whole alphabet soup of, of, of Roosevelt's New Deal. Um, and what developed, and especially in relation to parks buildings, was something called Park Rustic Style. Um, it was an outgrowth of, of what originally was an earlier style um, that started in, in, in older parks like Yosemite um, and some of the big western parks, and they started to build in this rustic style. Um, and then they started to take some of the traditions from the Adirondacks, and it became a national style, so much so that the federal government actually published books on what public parks buildings should look like. Um, and this is what they should look like. Um, according to the federal government in the 1930s. Um, this is the park rustic style. You can see from this the extensive use of natural materials, um, stone, log, and, and they usually tried to use them in the rawest forms um, so that the logs, they, they were, you could see that they were logs, and the stones that you could see that they were, you know, fresh out of the ground. Um, in Steuben County, Public Works Administrations not only did most of the, the, the big buildings um, at Pokagon, they also did things like the, um, the, the police building in Angola, um, and they also paid for things uh, like the um, Hysterical American Buildings Survey, which documented things like the Powers Church, um, and where they'd actually send out unemployed draftsmen to make detailed measured drawings of these historic buildings. This is a Clear Lake Cottage. Um, park rustic style, again, you can see massive field stone chimney, um, the use of the, um, the, the, uh, the logs as the cladding. Another park rustic style, again, this is at Clear Lake, um, showing the field stone construction um, and in a holdover from some of the arts and crafts styling. Um, this, this was a, a wood shingle, but also the use of the um, exposed rafter tails. Um, this is a cottage at Long Lake, again near Pleasant Lake. 
Um, and this is kind of that 1940s park rustic um, wood log revival. Um, massive field stone fireplace again, the use of wood logs as cladding. Um, and this one with the orientation parallel to the lake. But again, it's still a cottage. You can still see that it's got a single pile massing, that it's got one room and then a, cot and then a, uh, um, a porch out on the front. Um, <laughs> the fabulous 50s, I, I, I wanted like crazy to, to extend the 50s because I think, you know, I, I certainly didn't live through them, but everything that I read and everything that I talk to parents and grandparents, the 50s lasted a heck of a lot longer than 10 years. Um, they they, they want to say from 1946 to 1964, which is the extent of the baby boom, um, but, but because I'm, I'm talking about um, dealing with the state, uh, we stopped at 1955, which was when the interstate first be became um, part of our lives. Um, when the soldiers came home from the war, they were they were in sort of a hurry. Um, they had had gone away and they had sacrificed four or five years of their life, um, and they they wanted to to get get into life, and so they um, built more buildings during that period than, than the United States has ever seen built in its history. Um, there were more kids born in, in, in that period than the United States has ever seen in its history. Um, they got busy in a big hurry. Um, so all of a sudden they, they had normal life and the lakes, especially here in Steuben County, <laughs> got back to business in, in, in a very big way. Um, so not only did, did the big lakes start to um, uh, re recover, but the little lakes too. Um, everybody thought, you know, well, I want a cottage too. So they ha they had the big lakes. They had James and George and Crooked and Clear and Gage and all those things. But then they also started to open up all of the little lakes too. So this is the period when all of the cottages on all of the little tiny lakes started to spring up. Um, I, I love this picture because um, I have to deal occasionally with lawyers, um, and this water wheel. Um, is something that, that would never pass muster today. Um, the object of this water wheel, just like some of the other follies that they had for kids at that time, was to get on top of that wheel and run as fast as you could until you couldn't anymore and then fall into the lake. Um, which, if they did that now, would be the biggest lawsuit you've ever seen just waiting to happen. Um, so, what those soldiers built when they came home um, wasn't uh, the, the most, what's the best way to say this? I'm not the biggest fan of minimal traditional architecture ever seen, because um, this is what it looked like. Um, this is the cottage this, that happened in the 1950s. They were efficient, they were fast, they put them up um, in, with unbelievable speed, but they, they did it without a lack of, uh, with, a, with a lack of detail. So you didn't have lots of curlicues, you didn't have stylistic elements, what you had was a functional unit. Um, just like they, they turned out all of those tanks and ships and airplanes, they did it fast, they did it efficiently, and it worked. So this is the post-war minimal traditional cottage. Um, they also used a new composite material with this wonder material called asbestos, um, <laughs> which you can see cl cladding the side of this, this cottage. Uh, again, another post-war minimal traditional cottage, this time, um, turned on its side, so again, asbestos siding, but um, instead of being parallel to the lake, it's perpendicular to the lake. Another one, this one's on Hamilton Lake, um, is a pyramidal roof form. And, and the gentleman here had an interesting comment earlier. When you looked at the 1870s, um, the roof forms were very steeply pitched. Um, by the 1950s, they flattened out considerably. Um, Again, composite siding, pyramidal roof form, low pitched. After the interstate um, happened, America kind of opened up to a sort of a homogenization of, of, of culture. Um, this is the first time that we started to see <coughs> restaurants that were more than three or four in a chain. This is the first time that we started to see hotels that were more than three and four or in a, ch in a chain. Um, and this is the first time that we started to see national trends um, rapidly grow across the United States. When they first started Greek Revival, it, it followed this kind of 
period where in the 1820s it started in New York and by the 1830s it was in Ohio and by the 1840s it was Indiana and by the 1850s it got to Wisconsin and so that it took 40 years for that style to happen. Um, by the time we got to the interstate era um, we had cottage styles like the A-frame sweeping across from California to Indiana and the whole style period lasted from about six years. Um, so back to your point about the, 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 uh, the pitch of the roof um, they, they went from the sublime to the ridiculous. So they went from those, those very, very flat um, pitched roofs from the 1950s to this one where the house is nothing but the roof. There, it's the roof and two walls is, is, is what the A-frame is. Um, this is uh, in 1950s in California and this was one of the first times that, that an architect you know, dictated a style. This is Richard Neutra. Um, it was one of his very earliest buildings. Um, the A-frame was, was, was easily assembled. You could buy it in a kit. They would, they would send it out to you, um, just like some of the Sears homes from the 1920s. Um, and in some of the smaller lakes here at, at Clear, um, in Steuben County, there's one on Golden Lake where there's a, there's a whole line of about six um, A-frames in a row. And I talked to a couple of the owners, and they said, oh, yeah, this, they, were, they were six guys, and they were all from um, the, the Steelworks in Gary, and they, they built them in six years. The first, first year they built Fred's cottage, the next year they got together and they built Bill's cottage, the third year they got together and they built Bob's cottage. And, and so that's how they would, would do that. They'd come up and they'd, they'd get out their hammers and they'd spend the summer. Um, and he, here's a picture of one of them. This is at Golden Lake. Um, it, again, it shows the typical, very steeply pitched gable roof orientation um, uh, uh, parallel to the lake so that it made the most use of its small lake lot. Um, one of the other extensive uh, things about A-frames is the extensive use of glass. Um, again, this front wall is nothing but glass, um, which now that we are dealing with, with gas prices approaching $3, um, must make their heating bills um, something, something fierce. Um, another style that developed right after this was the, the modern style, the 50s modern. And this is an example um, at Hamilton Lake. Um, Something that it's the here's it's got a shed roof instead of a, a typical gable roof. The shed it's it's just one 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 plane that's not two planes meeting in the center. It's just one plane. Um, they they had a an emphasis on the horizontal that that kind of came from the Frank Lloyd Wrightian Usonian houses, um, and that it also had an, an uh, emphasis on an open plan. They started to move away from uh, the older plans where you had parlors and you had dining rooms. They, 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 this, is, this is the beginning of the great room concept that is, is so popular now. Um, yeah, I asked for that. Was that perhaps at Lake Gage? This is at Hamilton Lake. Um, this is the next kind of era that, that, that I that dealt with. Um, from 1956 to 1964 is one thing, but the, the, we start to see a real change in the, in the cottages at this point. Um, if you remember back to when I started, I started talking about um, a pre-air conditioning. And by the late 1950s, widespread air conditioning had changed America. Um, we were, were not living as much outside as, as we were at, at that point. Um, the interstate had changed America. All of a sudden, you could get on that interstate and drive 70 or 80 miles an hour and be somewhere in a, in a real short time. Um, so this starts to begin the transformation of the cottage era. Um, the, um, the cottage went from some place that was a three-month habitation window to something that was a year-round habitation window um, because you could, you could do that. You could live here and work in, in Ann Arbor, or you could live here and you could work in Fort Wayne, or you could live in Fort Wayne um, and, and, and have a cottage that you could be at by, by dinner. Um, so again, the interstate system completely changed our society. The use of widespread, the widespread use of air conditioning. Um, in the 60s, um, something that, that we take for granted was the, the widespread affluence of the middle class. Um, during the 60s, union jobs and factory jobs paid um, a, a really livable wage um, for a whole bunch of people. Um, a lot more people um, became middle class, um, and that was something that was a, a, a trend historically that we've seen 
um, start to, to move away from. Um, the other thing was that the lake lots dramatically increased in value. Um, everybody wanted to be at the lake. So those cottages and those people that had lake cottages saw something that they bought for $10,000. All of a sudden they were selling for $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 for those lots. Um, and the other thing that happened and is still happening is, is that the access to the lakes um, and the access to the in, uh, utilities and infrastructure around the lakes became um, so much better. So you can see that even now, um, when the sewer systems around lakes become fully functional, not only do the values of those cottages go go up dramatically, but the, but the temptation to make um, a big cottage out of a small lot rises as well because all of a sudden you're not dealing with a septic system anymore. Um, so as the price of that land rises, we, we're starting to see some trends here. Um, the, the small lake cottages are increasingly remodeled um, so, so that they meet not only modern space requirements, but zoning and sanitary regulations as well. This is um, uh, at, at Cold Springs on Hamilton Lake. And this broke my heart um, because it's about as lovely of a park rustic structure as you can, you can possibly imagine. Um, but they put a hat on it that at this phase, stage is just ugly. I mean, they, they actually did a nice job at the end of it, um, so I, I will commend them that. But as I drove by that day, I said, what can you possibly be thinking? Um, but I also understand that if you've got two people, four people, eight people, and you've got one bedroom, it sure makes a heck of a lot of money. If you sure makes a heck of a lot of sense if you spend a whole bunch of money to buy the cottage to add on to it because you can enjoy it more. Um, so the trend that I talked about earlier, um, and this is a this isn't Stewart County, and the, the name has been hidden to protect the not so innocent. Um, that you know, you're going to see this, and it's going to continue. Um, that the lake cottages that we do have. Um, are going to increasingly be replaced um, by lake houses, and, and they're not cottages anymore. They're, they're not designed in a pre-air conditioning way. They're not de designed with one single pile massing. They're not designed to be only a three-month habitation win window. Most of them are not even designed with porches anymore. Um, so again, I showed you uh, the South Shore of Clear Lake earlier where they had taken the, the, the real early vernacular cottage and replaced it with a whole row of arts and crafts cottages. Um, this is something that, you, that we're just going to see, um, that the cottages are going to increasingly be replaced with houses. Um, the only enduring factor, um, you come back to it, why were they here in the first place? Because Northern Indiana is still a great place to fish. It's a great place to bring families to swim in the lake. It's a great place because the lakes are really still beautiful and that's, that's the enduring factor. So, thank you. Um, if you've got questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer some or uh, if, if, if Ron, if you've got more meeting stuff to handle or. No, I'm just gonna invite you to, to uh his brain while he's here. Well, one of the things that I noticed you know, from the early cottages, we're right. talking about the 1890s, early 1900s, 1910, <clears throat> they cut the trees down and that became the foundation of those pillars you're talking they about. They sure did. They didn't add pillars. No. And actually, the, I, I found a, a cottage and I found it here in Clear Lake, um, and it's off in the woods a little bit um, behind the town hall. There's a cottage back there where they have barrels that they filled with concrete. And that's what the, that, that cottage is resting on. So, one of the pictures you showed there was a, the only gnawn cottage. And that's they just tore that down. I, I, I was I was going to make an editorial comment about that. Um, I think that you have had enough experience with Mr. McNaughton dealing with the the sale of all of the things that he he acquired and and and, and left, um, so that I didn't didn't want to chime in. As they tore that down, that's what that cottage was on, with barrels. Yep. It looked like wine barrels filled with concrete. Yeah. That's the only thing 
Yeah. Well, and because and most of them, they, they would build them in a relatively quick way. Um, I, I, I had a reporter from the Fort Wayne uh, newspaper up here last week, um, and I uh, was showing her some of the historic buildings in Steuben County, um, and, and, and completely unplanned, I took her to the old McNaughton Cottage. Um, and because I was going to say this is one of the coolest cottages out here, it's built in the shingle style. And I got there, and there was you know a, a hole about two feet deep where everything had been cleared off. And so if I had tried to make the point to her any better about these cottages are disappearing faster than you can say boo, um, I couldn't have. So. I remember about one was about 1935 or six, the uh, Board of Health made everybody like around clearly. Everybody had an outhouse behind their hot, their cottage. Right. That's what we used. And for <coughs> septic tanks, what we used is oil barrels. Right. That's what they had back then. Well, and and you know that's that's the sort of thing, especially in '35 and '36, which was just coming out of the heights of the depression, that, that they would use anything they possibly can. Um, it's interesting because I've gone to a couple lakes still here in Steuben County where you s the, the lakes that still have the septic systems and one of them is Fox Lake um, just outside of Angola still has septic systems and so the density of cottages is remarkably different than, the, than you see at James and George and Clear and Gage um, because they don't have um, the ability to build large cottages because they all have to provide room for a septic field. Homes. Yes. Have you been able to identify any around the um, Not around the lakes, but I have identified um, about four um, in Steuben County. Um, there's one uh, just west of Angola, southwest of Angola as you head out. There's one um, between Angola and Fremont on, on uh, was it 428 or 528? 527. Um, 427. And then um, there's a couple more in the city of Angola. So, well, again, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk to you privately as well. Um, thank you again to Ron. Um, thank you again to Peg. Um, thanks again to the people that I've listed up here on the on the on the uh, the screen. Hope um, Wilson was was my was my pal here. I, I, I would I would swing in and say, Hope, can you make a copy of this for me? Hope, can you make a copy of that for me? Um, one of the reasons that there are a lot of pictures from Cold Springs um, is a gentleman named Quentin Watkins who owns Cold Springs Resort as part of the family that owns it. And as a, a, a amateur historian, he's collected and scanned into the computer. Um, uh, roughly 4,000 um, uh, old postcards from Cold Springs, from Hamilton, um, from Penn Park, from Island Park, all of these different little um, areas around that area. So I was able to access those in a digital format, which makes putting together a presentation like this significantly easier. Um, the other place that has a really good collection of, of postcards is the Clear Lake Association. On their website, um, you can um, go to the, that, and, and they have a whole bunch of pictures of Clear Lake from well, the Earl earlier. Had all the postcards. Everybody had postcards given to Earl, and he put them in his books. Yeah, and, and he had copies of all of them. Uh, and I don't I know. Got I don't a big know. Box full of them too, but he's got copies. He had copies of all of them, and he probably got them. No, we didn't get those. No. Didn't you get some of those? Were actually sold at one of the early auctions, and. They brought more money than we were willing to pay. Is that right? Yeah. But vintage postcards, surprising enough, have become a big business. Um, the, you can go on, on, on the internet and find tons and tons of people selling vintage postcards. And you can go to any um, antiquarian shop. You can go to any um, just you know flea market. And there are lots of people that will sell those postcards for $10 a piece, $15 a piece. Um, so that's a pretty good amount of money when you add up thousands of postcards. So...